Amen. Amen. Church, you can go ahead and take your seats. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that none shall perish, but so all, so all shall have eternal life. Mm. Church, if we never get not one thing that we ask for ever again, may we rest in the fact that that has been given to us. Amen. So here we are, church, talking about old Joseph. Good old Joseph, one of my favorite guys from Scripture, uh, alongside of Joshua and uh, and John the Baptist. John the Baptist was a little a little rough when he when he brought the word. Right, everybody's these sinners like repent, 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 repent. Like the grace was not really there so much with John the Baptist. But man, was it true? Um, but then you have guys like uh, like Joseph who. Uh, chose to lead in love. And we see that in every circumstance Joseph is put in. How does he respond? With love. He could respond any other way. Especially my, my man Joseph had every right, every right to complain about his circumstance and situation. Right? Uh, and so here's what we're going to do. We're going to look at Joseph, uh, his story picking up in chapter 40 of Genesis and 41 there's a lot to read. There's a lot to read. So I hope y'all brought, hope y'all are ready. Um, if you want to follow along with me, that's great. Um, we're going to summarize a little bit of it, but uh, for the most part, we're going to rock right into it. So last we left our boy, Joseph, he was in the prison. He was in the prison. All right. So that's important because verse four or chapter 40, this being the prison after this, the king of Egypt's cupbearer and baker offended their master, the king of Egypt. Pharaoh was angry with his two officers, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker, and put them in custody in the house of in the house of the captain of the guards, in the prison where Joseph was confined. The captain of the guards assigned Joseph to them as their personal attendant, and they were in custody for some time. Verse 5 says, the king of Egypt's cupbearer and baker who were confined in prison each had a dream, and both of them had a dream on the same night. Each dream had its own meaning. When Joseph came to them in the morning, he saw that they looked distraught. So he asked Pharaoh's officers, who were in custody with him in his master's house, why do you look so sad today? Verse 8 says, we had dreams, they said to him, but there is no one to interpret them. Then Joseph said to them, don't interpretations belong to God? And then he says something interesting. He says, tell me your dreams. Verse 9 says, so the chief cupbearer told his dream to Joseph. And he goes on to say, in my dream, there was a vine in front of me. And on the vine were three branches. As soon as it budded, its blossoms came out and its clusters ripened into grapes. Pharaoh's cup was in my hand. And I took the grapes and squeezed them into Pharaoh's cup and placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. This is its interpretation, Joseph said to him. The three branches are three days. In just three days, Pharaoh will lift you up, uh, lift up your head and restore you to your position. You will put Pharaoh's cup in his hand the way you used to when you were his cupbearer. But when all goes well for you, remember that I was with you. Please show your kindness to me by mentioning me to Pharaoh and get me out of this prison. For I was kidnapped from the land of the Hebrews, and even here I have done nothing that they should put me in the dungeon. When the chief baker saw that the interpretation was positive, he said to Joseph, Oh, well, I also had a dream. Three baskets of white bread were on my head. In the top basket were all sorts of baked goods for Pharaoh, but the birds were eating them out of the basket on my head. This is his interpretation, Joseph replied. The three baskets are three days. In just three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head from off you. Now you can probably be like, what? From off me? What's he talking about? And hang you on a tree. Then the birds will eat the flesh from your body. Now, if I'm the baker, I'm like, really, bro? He gets a nice, nice interpretation and y'all gonna, you're gonna say that for me? What do I do to you, Joseph? Listen, can, can I encourage you? Listen. Sometimes y'all know this, you get to give the good news and you get to give the bad news. But Joseph wasn't scared about what, what news he was giving, right? 
He He's simply a messenger. But he wasn't scared about that. He's like, hey, I got you. I'm sorry, it's bad news. So here's what happened. Verse 20 says, on the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday. So wow, it's Pharaoh's birthday. And he gave a feast for all his servants. He elevated the chief cupbearer and the chief baker among his servants. Pharaoh restored the chief cupbearer to his position as cupbearer. And he placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. But Pharaoh hanged the chief baker, just as Joseph had explained to him. Yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph. He forgot him. I don't know what that baker did uh, to deserve that. Could you imagine that? You're hanged on the Pharaoh's birthday. Like that's, man, how grim can it get? And so two different dreams, two different interpretations, cupbearers back in the good graces. And he had one job, right? Joseph's like, listen, you got one job, cupbearer. I mean, you got a bunch of jobs, but you got one job. Please let them know about me. Let them know I've been in here. And what happens? He forgot about him. Sound like our walk sometimes with Christ. Man, does God come through? He never fails. Always comes through. And right when we're out of our tragedy, we forget him. Right? Until we need something. Now, I'm not saying that's all of us. I, I, I'm, I'm very guilty of this, though. You know, <laughs> we think we need God in the pit. We think we need God in the prison, but let me tell you what, we need God in the palace as well. We just don't go and turn to God when things are going bad. We need to praise him, right? Like like scripture says, continue to pray, pray at all times, praise him. But we act like the cupbearer sometimes and we forget him until things are bad again. So chapter 41 goes on to say, at the end of two years, Pharaoh had a dream. So how much, how many more years was now Joseph in prison? Two years. Who, who knows a lot can happen in two years? Woo, a lot can happen in nine months. A lot can happen in two years. Think of all the stuff that he missed out on. Was he complaining? Was he mad? He's like, hey, where's the cupbearer? Can you go get him? I need to remind him what I did for him. Like, nah, he trusted God. He trusted that God had everything under control. And here it is. At the end of two years, and Pharaoh has a dream. Pharaoh has this dream where he's standing beside the Nile and he sees uh, seven healthy cows, right? And then he sees seven sickly cows and the sickly cows end up eating the healthy cows. And then what happens? Pharaoh wakes up and he's like, what the heck? No world was that all about, right? Probably gets up, gets a glass of milk, lays back down. Oh, I'm going to shake that off. That was a weird dream, right? Y'all ever have weird dreams? So he lays back down and has another dream. And he sees seven heads of grain, right? And he's like, oh, man, this is awesome. But then what happens? Seven healthy heads. Then there's seven sickly heads. And the sickly heads end up eating the healthy heads. And so Pharaoh's like, why do I keep having all these sickly things, eating things? What is going on? Um, and so Pharaoh... Uh, in verse 8 it says when morning came he was troubled so he summoned all of the magicians of Egypt and its wise men Pharaoh told them his dreams but no one could interpret them for him I wonder if they just didn't want to tell him the bad news you got to tell the Pharaoh the bad news he just hung a baker for like burning the bread and now you got to go tell him that uh, this isn't good right magicians wise men uh well, just then, our boy, the cupbearer, he says to Pharaoh, today I remember my faults. Good job. Two years later, at least you remembered. Today I remembered my faults. Verse 10 says, Pharaoh was angry with his servants, and he put me in the chief baker in the custody of the captain of the guards. He and I had dreams on the same night. Each dream had its own meaning. Now a young Hebrew, a young Hebrew, a slave of the captain of the guards, was with us there. We told him our dreams. He interpreted our dreams for us. Each one had its own interpretation. It turned out just the way he interpreted them to us. I was restored to my position and the other man was hanged. Then Pharaoh sent for Joseph and they quickly brought him from the dungeon. I want you to notice what he does. He shaved, changed his clothes and went to Pharaoh. So he didn't say... I'm all nasty. I'm just going to whatever, you know, he wasn't 
he, he actually took some uh, pride in his appearance. The dude shaved, right? He probably just trimmed his beard, not completely, but he shaved, right? Changed his clothes, made sure he looked good for the Pharaoh. The Pharaoh said to Joseph, I've had a dream and no one can interpret it. But I have heard it said about you that you can hear a dream and interpret it. I am not able to, Joseph answered the Pharaoh. It is God who will give the Pharaoh a favorable answer. Did he take the glory for himself? No. First chance he gets. It's not me. It's, it's God. It's God. So Pharaoh said to Joseph, in my dream, I was standing on the bank of the Nile. He goes through the whole deal. Um, goes through the, the cows getting eaten up, the grain getting eaten up. And then Joseph says to Pharaoh, Pharaoh, the dreams mean the same thing. God has revealed to the Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good cows are seven years and the seven good heads are seven years. The dreams mean the same thing. The seven thin, sickly cows that came up after them are seven years and the seven worthless scorched heads of grain are seven years of famine. It is just as I told Pharaoh, God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. Seven years of great abundance are coming throughout the land of Egypt. After them, seven years of famine will take place and all the abundance in the land of Egypt will be forgotten. The famine will devastate the land. The abundance in the land will not be remembered because of the famine that follows it for the famine will be very severe. Since the dream was given twice to Pharaoh, it means that the matter has been determined by God and he will carry it out soon. So now let Pharaoh look for a discerning and wise man. Set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh do this. Let him appoint overseers over the land and take a fifth of the harvest of the land of Egypt during the seven years of abundance. Let them gather all the excess food during these good years that are coming under Pharaoh's authority. Store the grain in the city so they may preserve it as food. The food will be a reserve for the land during the seven years of famine that will take place in the land of Egypt. Then the country will not be wiped out by famine. Verse 37 says, The proposal pleased Pharaoh and his servants. And he said to them, Can we find anyone like this? A man who has God's spirit in him. Pharaoh noticed something very special about Joseph. Not just that he could interpret dreams, but he had, he had the spirit of God inside of him. Now this is before Jesus steps on the scene. This is before Moses. This is before uh, a, a lot of what's about to come. And even then, Joseph loved his Lord, his God. And it was evident because they could see it on him. You know, I wonder if it's evident in our lives that people can see Jesus in us, that people can see that we are walking with the Lord. Because uh, let me tell you what, we do a great job blending in with the world, right? We, man, we are good at camouflaging to look like the rest of the world. And so verse 39 says, so Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has made all this known to you, there is no one as discerning and wise as you are. You will be over my house and my people will obey your commands. Only I as king will be greater than you. Pharaoh also said to Joseph, see, I am placing you over all the land of Egypt. Pharaoh removed his signet ring from his hand and put it on Joseph's hand. He clothed him with fine linen garments and he placed a gold chain around his neck. He had Joseph ride in his second chariot and servants called out before him, make way. So he placed him over all the land of Egypt. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh and no one will be able to raise his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt without your permission. Pharaoh gave Joseph the name Zaphnaphanath, Peneth, and gave him a wife, Asenath, daughter of Potiphar, not Potiphar, Potiphar, a different person, who was a priest at On. And Joseph went throughout the land of Egypt. So why did all the people that Joseph encountered trust him? Well, it's because Joseph loved God. 
He loved God with everything he had. And because he loved God, he trusted God. He didn't just trust God in the good times. And let me tell you, it didn't seem like there was very many good times for Joseph. Imagine, imagine you're the youngest, youngest of all these brothers. You get beaten up, thrown in a pit, and then sold into slavery. You get wrongly accused of trying to hook up with your master's wife, right? Thrown in prison. All the while, he kept his faith in God. And why? Because he loved God. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5 says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. Joseph loved God. So what does it mean to love God with all of our heart, our soul, and our strength? Well, the Apostle Paul lays it out for us in 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 through 7. And so in our walk with Christ, it's important to remember this. For God so loved the world, right? He loved the world. That means you. That means me. That means the people that you don't think deserve love. Like grace is especially for them. Uh, He loved us when we were at our worst, right? He loves us when we're difficult, when we're selfish, when we're stingy. He loves us. He loves us. And he knew that love was sacrifice. And so in order for us to have a relationship with him, for us to be made with him in in, in eternity, with him, that it was going to cost a sacrifice. And so in these verses, we've been going through these with our students. And uh, at ICA, uh, we do a fellowship of Christian athletes huddle every Wednesday at lunch. And we've been going through 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7, and we pick a different word every week. And I pray for these kids and, and every week. And so Asa comes with me sometimes. Normally, uh, Ben is always with me. He's interning with us on Wednesdays. I love my boy, Ben. And, uh, and, and we've really dissected this because here's the deal. It's one thing to read the command, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your strength. It's another thing to know what that love is. What is love? right? It's not just a song. It just doesn't follow by baby. Don't hurt me. Like we got to know what is love in the world. Their definition of love is very lustful. Like we have this image of love and it's more of a lust. Let me tell you what love is. And for those of you on the road here, this is for you. First Corinthians 13 verse four starts off with love is the first word. Love is. So listen, the first week we did this, we just stopped there. I read the whole verse, but we said, we're going to look at patient. What does it mean to be patient? If we truly love someone, we're patient with them, right? Uh, There's a reason Paul started off with patience because he knew, man, if they can get that, right? If, If they could just get patience, the rest of this will flow, right? Patient. Love is patient. And now if you're in the seats and you have notes and you're taking notes and you, uh, you want to try and experiment and you, when you hear these words, love is patient, give yourself a rating. How patient are you? One to a hundred, right? Uh, I'm a negative 15. Um, it's very evident. Go, go shopping right now at any time, any place, go drive in Port St. Lucie. You think you're patient? Love is patient. Now, Now, I I don't want to discourage you. This is the kind of love that God has for us. It's an agape love. It's a godly love. And it's the kind of love that we're supposed to have with others. God is patient. When we first start taking steps as new baby Christians, just as if you have a newborn, when that kid starts to take a step, takes one step and wobbles over and falls, right? Matter of fact, it might not even take a step. You're just hoping like, oh, that was a step. That was a step. Right, right, right. You're excited, right? You're excited. Oh my gosh, little man just took a step. Ah!" Right? Here's what we do with people that are just learning how to take steps. (laughs) Idiot. Get up. Why'd you fall? I can't believe you fell. Don't you know how many times I told you about that? And here you all falling all over the floor. What would that look like if we did that as parents to our littles? Man, they ain't going to walk no time, right? But yeah, we're quick to do that with new Christians. 
right? We're quick to shoot them in the face instead of give them a warm embrace. I didn't mean for that to rhyme. So here's the deal. Love is patient. When we take one step, don't you think God is like that father that's like, oh my gosh, Mike, I've been waiting for you to take that step. You've been sitting in that seat for two years now and you finally took a step. Oh, don't you think he's celebrating? Don't you think he's rejoicing? But he's patient with us. He knows we're gonna fall, but he's patient with us, right? And because he's patient with us, love is also kind. It doesn't envy. It's not boastful. It's not arrogant. It's not rude. It's not self-seeking. It's not irritable. It does not keep no record of wrongs, which by the way, that's another one that that should probably be a little higher up there because all of us are good at keeping record of wrongs. Like, oh yeah, yeah, I forgave you. Ladies, especially y'all, I'm not harping on y'all, but it's like, yeah, I forgave you. And then a couple weeks later, there's an argument. It's like, well, you remember that one time that you, no, no, wait a minute. You forgave me. You're not allowed to bring that back up, right? Right, right. Keeping records of wrongs. Like we have this little notebook that we're just waiting to pull this stuff up and when they mess up, right? That's not what love does. Love forgives, man. But it goes on to say, it finds no joy in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Does this sound like the love that you have for God? Are you patient with him? Or are you trying to hurry him up? God, if you would just give me this now, like, like in my timing, because my timing's so much better than yours, God, right? We don't say that, but that's what we mean. We get impatient with God. I've done it. I started praying for a son back in, uh, back in, in 20, 2012. I started praying for a son. And I only prayed for two months. Now I was a young Christian. I thought, well, two months, he's not come through. And God blew my mind because that next weekend, my wife sends me a picture of a pregnancy stick while I was at drill for the the National Guard. I knew right then. And God didn't have to do that. He didn't have to do that. But man, was he so good. And was it such a reminder about being patient in his time, fam, in his time. And so are you patient with him? Are you kind? Do you envy? Are you boastful about other things? Are you arrogant? Are you rude? Are you self-seeking? Which is another word for selfish. That's sin right there. Selfish, inherited nature. Me, 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 me. And when I don't get my way, I may not throw a fit like a little two-year-old in Walmart, but I'm throwing a fit like a two-year-old in Walmart, but my own little way. See, Jesus echoes this in Matthew 22, verse 7. He echoes, not 1 Corinthians, but he echoes Deuteronomy 6, 5. And he says, he says, love the Lord your God, right? The Pharisees are trying to trap him up with the greatest command. They're thinking, do not kill, do not that. But he says, love the Lord your God with everything you have, your whole heart, all your strength, all your mind, your soul. And then he trips him up too. He's like, hey, and by the way, The second is equally as important. Love your neighbor as yourself. And the apostles are like, well, who's our neighbor? And he's like, check, look around. That's your neighbor, right? But he knew that we cannot truly love our neighbor the way we need to love our neighbor until we were madly, fully in love with God. Because here's the deal. You might be able to fake the funk for a little bit but you're going to get tired. You're going to get weary and you're going to want to just write that person off. There's a lot of times that we probably should have been wrote off, especially in the eyes of the Lord. He is holy. And here we come to him with our selfish wants. (laughs) And, and, And it's, it's not a need. It's a want. And then we get mad that he doesn't answer our selfish wants in a timely manner. That's because we are viewing God as a genie in a lamp. God ain't no genie in a lamp. He's not no mythical creature. He is the creator. And let me tell you this. Here's what happens. 
we end up spending more time worshiping the created than the creator. It's because our hearts out of line. It's because our priorities are out of line. Where your heart is, that's where your treasure is. And it drives me nuts that we will make time for concerts, for football games. Matter of fact, we'll get to football games early, three hours early, and sit in a parking lot for a game that nobody knows who we are. Right? I know you think you're Taylor Swift hanging out with Travis Kelsey, but they don't know who you are. They don't care. And we'll go in there and we'll drop about 300 bucks on food and merchandise and this and that. And we'll wear our, our guy's favorite number on our chest and on our back. Meanwhile, they have no idea who we are. But when it comes to spending time with the Lord, when it comes to giving God everything we have, my God, I'll give you whatever I got left over. That's not what he wants. There's a reason he told the Israelites so many years ago, I don't want the blood. I want your heart. There was a reason that he said, hey, I'm going to have to send my son once and for all to be the ultimate sacrifice because people just didn't get it. Church, I wish, I wish you could see God how he sees you. Fearfully and wonderfully made. God, I wish we could be as patient with others as God is with us. I wish we could, we could just be kind to one another. What would this world look like if we just mastered those two things? And not out of our own power, but out of the power of the Holy Spirit. Because listen, we've been trying to master that stuff way too long. There's a reason it's called road rage. Amen. How dare they cut me off? How dare they ruin my day? How dare they make me late? Listen, as a child of God, your time is not your own. It is his. Everything belongs to him. You have been paid for with a price. A high price. You are his children. Why do we, why do we hurry up to, to be done spending time with him? Why is it that we give him just these flippant prayers and just these, these man, this, hey, I'm just going to pray. Hey, we're about to eat. Somebody pray. Somebody pray. Uh, uh, all right, good. We're done eating. We, we, we pray. Now we can eat and not feel guilty about the food we're going to consume. Like, listen, if that's the only time we talk to God, then we have it backwards. Because if we, have, we are in a relationship with God, if we have a true relationship with God, guess what? Man, we're talking to him. We're spending time with him. We're praising him. We're worshiping him. If me and my wife had started dating and I seen her one time, man, she's awesome. Great. Man, I like this. I like this girl. She's, she's amazing. And then I never call her. Am I in a relationship with her? Nah, I just kind of know she exists. I know she's out there. I like the idea of having a girlfriend. But, man, yeah, whatever. See, I think the problem is some of us like the idea of being in a relationship with God rather than actually being in a relationship with God because it takes sacrifice. Here's what God has asked us. Give me your old, nasty, gnawed up heart and let me give you new life. And then because I've given you this new life, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go and I want you to treat others the way you want to be treated. I want you to go out and I want you to love people. Can y'all do that? And we're like, it's a lot to ask, God. Eternity, yeah, sounds great, but I'm looking for the now. Let me tell you what. We spend way too many time, way too much time investing in earthly things that have no matter. It's not gonna mean anything at the end of this world. People are gonna forget you when you die. No matter how great you are, they will forget you when you die. They won't remember you had a Tesla. Uh, they won't remember all these crazy. They won't remember your favorite football team. Do you remember your grandpa from 200 years ago? Do you remember your grandma from 300 years ago? You will be forgotten. Instead of building earthly monuments, how about we spend our time investing in eternal relationships? Because that relationship with God the Father is all that matters. It all it's all that matters. And listen. Why don't people want to come to know Jesus? Why don't they want a relationship with the Father? They think they're not worthy. Can I remind you again? For God so loved the world. 
He says you're worthy. He wants to meet you right where you're at. He's not asking you to clean yourself up before you come to him. All he's saying is come to me. Arms wide open. Come to me. I love you. I want to spend time with you. Why don't you want to spend time with me? If we're going to truly love God, we have to spend time with him. We have to spend time in his word. We have to spend time praising that's why I'm so I'm so laser focused about the way we praise. And it's like, man, I've seen more people sing. I've seen people sing louder at a Jelly Roll concert. Or I haven't been to Jelly Roll, but I'm just saying from the videos, I've seen people sing louder at concerts for secular artists. Matter of fact, I've seen people sing louder at Christian concerts for the artist on stage instead of singing for the one who created them. But yet when we come in here as brothers and sisters, as family, we have heartedly lift our voices. It's because I think we're more of a, God is more of an acquaintance to us instead of our everything. He's our sustainer. If you are a child of the Lord, then guess what? He is your God and he loves you and he cares for you and he wants the best for you and he just wants to spend time with you. So don't be worried about how many steps you're going to take. Don't be worried about how big the step is you're going to take. Can I urge you? Just take a step. Because if we say that we're followers of Jesus and he's two miles down the road at Wawa and we're still sitting in these seats, we aren't following Jesus. We're looking at him on our GPS. Dang, Jesus got far. He's at Wawa already, right? No, to follow somebody means that you have to follow them. That means that you take steps, active steps, one after another. Everybody in here has a next step. We're not called to be stale. We're not called to be stagnant. We're not called to plateau. We're called to continuously grow in his love, in the wisdom that he brings through his word. As we praise the only one worthy of all of our praise, all of the love and all of our admiration. So here's what we're going to do. If you guys can, go ahead and bow your heads, close your eyes. As you're sitting there, heads bowed, eyes closed. Can I make a plea? Ask God to examine where you're at. Ask him to examine your heart right here, right now. And then if you truly love him, ask him to remove the idols that you have crafted for yourself the creation that we've been worshiping versus the creator. Ask him to fix your eyes solely on him and to not be overcome by this world, but to rejoice because he has won. Rejoice because he's brought you home. And if there's anybody in here who's never made that decision today, here's the deal. I'm going to go a little old school with y'all. I can't see hearts, but I can see hands. God knows your heart. But if you're saying today, you know what? I've never really, I've never really fully surrendered over to, I've given him bits and pieces, but I've never really fully surrendered. And you're saying today is the day. Here's what I want you to do. I'm not going to ask you to come up front or anything like that. I'm not going to ask you to stand up even. Just shoot up your hand. Nobody looking around, heads bowed, eyes closed. Shoot up your hand. If today is the day that you're like, I'm giving God my full, amen. My full heart, not half a heart, but I'm giving him my everything, amen. Here's what I want to do. I want to pray for you. All those with hands raised, I want to pray for you. And I'm going to pray for the rest of us who, in our hearts, <laughs> our hands are raised, but we just aren't sure enough to raise it up. And as I pray for you, I'd like you to pray for those around you. Pray for those that are hurting right now. Pray for those that are going through a storm. They're in the prison. They're in the pit. And they don't know where God is. God, I pray, Lord that they open their eyes and realize that you are there with them, walking through them with this. And so, Father, thank you for the hearts in here. Thank you for the ones who realize that they've, they've just maybe gone stale, realize that maybe they've gone lukewarm, Lord, and, and I pray a revival. Father, I pray that uh, the flame is lit. You fan every, every flame. No matter if it's gone small, if it's burning bright, Father, fan it. Because it's only 
through you that we can love our neighbors. And so, Father, thank you for loving us when we're unlovable. Thank you for loving us when we're nasty to each other. I thank you for your grace. And I pray that we can have the same love and the same grace for everyone that we encounter for the rest of our days. And when we start to complain about our circumstance, we can look at Joseph and we can be inspired and we can be encouraged that when he was in the pit, when he was in the prison, God, he was praising you. And so as you're sitting there praying, we're about to sing this last song. This song is one of my favorite songs. And I don't know what kind of posture of praise you want to be in, whether you want to stand, whether you want to get on your knees and, and, and turn your chair. But I want to encourage you as we sing these songs of praise, let's give him our whole heart. Because here's the deal. He doesn't care about our abilities, but man, does he want our availability. Because all we really have, <laughs> all we really have is a hallelujah. And so church, let's do this. If you want to stand, let's go ahead and stand. And we're going to sing this last song with voices raised high and with hearts in tune with his. Father, we love you. We thank you. It's in your name we pray. In the name of Jesus, amen.